Okay, welcome back. Not self, getting straight into it. So this is an inversion of the previous stage in a way. Whereas the previous stage was all about form, this is all about emptiness. What's new in this stage is that the sense of self, of identifying with everything, has been seen to be not a fundamental property of experience, but emergent and therefore an empty construction. Everything they peer into, they feel that it is not self, that it has this impersonal quality to it. At not self, the person still feels like they exist in a consciousness bubble. There is this still cage of the mind type deal. There is a, a membrane to their mind, just as there was in the previous stage. And again, this is referring to their default perception of things. Though they may be able to temporarily dissolve that sense of the boundary and say, go into jhana 5, boundless space, they always return to a bounded mind space in day-to-day -day life. There is a lot more clarity of perception and one begins to recognize the utility of deconstructing and unbinding sense impressions from one another. At this stage, emptiness is the focal insight and practice. But emptiness itself hasn't been seen to be empty. It is still reified in the mind as an actual thing, but this will fade and fade as one progresses. Everything arises from the emptiness and returns to the emptiness. This special nothing place becomes deeply interesting and mysterious. It seems to be the source of everything. Just as many people when they consider the Big Bang, the origin of the universe, they think about it happening at one source point which everything emerges from. Well, during the not-self stage, the mind is conceived of in a similar way. There is some singularity point from which all phenomena arise. This is still a core or a center to them. They may peer their attention into this void and not really understand what they are perceiving. This is a pretty mature stage and there is a continuous thinning out of experience. You know, at standard perception, reality was conceived of as being very hard and physical. At the witness, everything had softened up a bit. At big mind, everything became gloopy and molasses-like. And at not-self, things are thinner still and very watery. Really, the decrease in sense of viscosity of the mind can only be appreciated in hindsight. And this thinning out of one's sense of default perception of reality means less overall contraction and less suffering. However, by now the practitioner is incredibly attuned to very slight arisings, and so you become hypersensitive to any fluctuations in mood and temperament. If there is some little inclining of disturbance or negative emotion, it's very obvious and unignorable. And what dukkha is left is also quite salient. At previous stages, you are arguably suffering more, but may be less likely to admit it even to yourself, as you're not as aware of it. And so, ironically, much larger than life claims of liberation may be made at earlier stages. However, personality and developmental stages in the, in the other sense will factor in here a great deal too. But at this stage though, it's a mature place, and so there is less kidding yourself with the limits of your freedom from suffering. Emotions still fluctuate often as they do in anyone, but you are far less reactionary and your sense of inner equanimity is incredibly deepened. Feeling it more, suffering less is a line that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so the sense of this is me has been seen through and its absence is obvious. And this includes the mind as a whole and all in experience. Instead, what is left is a sense of not-self, meaning a sense of not-me, which coalesces with all mind objects when attention is directed towards them. Whatever one points attention to, there is an anti-identification with, a sense of this is not me. What is unclear to the person in the stage is that the feeling of not-self is just like the feeling of self, in that it too is an empty construction that can cease to be represented in the mind. There is still the epistemic agent, though it's perceived as not-self, 
And this continues the sense that experience is happening to one being. It's just not a personal thing. There is still the sense of there being one unified mind in each moment. But this epistemic agent has this empty void in the heart of its being. And because the sense of not self necessitates the sense of self, like black entails white, though this isn't totally understood yet at an experientially integrated level to someone at this stage, for the sense of not self to dominate experience, the sense of self is pushed into their blind spot and peripheral awareness. These are the parts of experience that haven't yet been objectified, meaning singled out in experience and understood as not fundamental, and they haven't been de-objectified, meaning seen as not things or lacking actuality in a profound sense. And a big case and point here being the sense of a center, a point of knowing, and a central structural point of experience. This empty source point of all things. So in this picture, there is a tiny speck of blue right in the center. Now, perhaps the person in question here can move that sense of a center. There are techniques to learn how to move it to different parts of the body, or even in the corner of the room. Eventually, they should start to notice the center flicker or appear and disappear rapidly whenever they incline the mind in that direction. And this really results in the ability to have brief non-dual moments of experience at any time. Although it's very fleeting and they can't be in this non-dual state with focused attention, they have to defocus the mind to get into it and this comes at a cost of perceptual clarity. And if we were to ask someone at this not-self stage, are you enlightened? They struggle to say yes or no. They may think, well, kind of, I'm not, not enlightened. Because most of the high-level teachings are comprehensible to them. They have direct insight into what they call no-self, emptiness, impermanence, and non-duality. However, at this stage and the previous stage, there can be perceived a lot of paradoxes and frankly cognitive dissonance between trying to make sense of and holding seeming conflicting views of self and not self, form and emptiness, consciousness and not consciousness, the many and the one, doing versus not doing. And these can be waved away by appealing to the mystery of reality, yet really the current framework of mind can't quite reconcile them. And at the same time, there's something that's still unsatisfactory for them. And I think for many people, they get to this stage and can linger in it for many, many years and end up just concluding, well, perhaps this is as good as it gets. I understand all the teachings. I've got great clarity of perception and inner equanimity. Maybe this is it. But really they will be flickering between this is it and this isn't quite it. Flickering of attention is the theme here. There's a lot of switching attention between form and emptiness, expansion and contraction, self and not self. One can grasp the duality, but only attend to one side of each dichotomy at a time and can't fully unify them. As they direct attention at yin, yang falls into peripheral awareness. And if they direct attention to yang, yin falls into peripheral awareness. This will change in the next stage. The idea that consciousness is the container space of everything to be aware of may still seem to ring true. Here, although the practitioner might deny it, as it's still in their blind spot, there is still a subtle distinguishing between the special substrate of consciousness and phenomenal content to be aware of. There is a subtle partition there for them. And this is a really important point to home in on. How exactly do you relate awareness to things to be aware of? Are they separate or are they next to each other? Or is awareness around everything or in everything? However you construe it, whatever relationship you draw between them means your mental models are building a slight duality. Real non-dual perception here means there is no longer a relationship to these things because one implies the other, and you couldn't possibly have one without the other, so much so that they are indistinguishable. 
This is the insight into codependent origination. Consciousness contains phenomenal content, and phenomenal content contains consciousness. But really, these two are actually category errors in themselves. Neither one really exists how the mind conceives of them. And this leads to the next stage. So we'll stop here, and in the meantime, take care of yourself, and look forward to the next video for the final video in this series, True No Self and No Center. It'll be good. See you then.